right, cool. How many people are ready for the word today? Amen? Ready for the word. Okay. Okay, well, if you remember last week, in last week's episode of uh, Gardena Valley Assembly, we talked about Hebrews chapter 9. We talked about the uh, five uh, deficiencies of why the Old Testament covenant is not as good as the New Testament. I'm going to review those for you real quick. The Old Testament earthly sanctuary was a physical temple. It was made by men. We also know that the sanctuary was a prototype for something greater. We also know that it was inaccessible to all people, so it had limited access. We also know that it was temporary. It was not eternal. And we also know that it was external and not internal. And if you want more information on that, I suggest that you listen to the sermon from last week online. We have all of our sermons posted, and we want to encourage you to do that. But now we're going to continue on with Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11. With We're going to give you now uh, five reasons why the New Testament sanctuary is superior to the Old Testament and why God's New Testament plan is a better plan. So, Father, we ask now your blessing to be upon us as we get into your word. Please open up the hearts and minds of your people, Lord God. They'd be able to focus and not chase rabbits. We also pray, Lord God, that as they focus, they'd be able to apply that which you have for them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said. Amen. As we break into Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11, I want to remind everybody here that the word of the day is alignment. And this concept of alignment ties in with Hebrews because if you're a Jewish person and you're still hanging on to the Old Testament plan for salvation, like many Jews are, you're missing out the bigger picture that God has the new plan in the New Testament. So we have to bring ourselves into proper alignment with God's word when it relates to our salvation. But as Christians, we have to bring ourselves into proper alignment with our lifestyle as well. You see, we might have a lifestyle that's out of alignment with God's word and out of alignment with his will for our lives, and so therefore we are misaligned. And if we're misaligned, then we're missing out on the blessings that God has for us. You see, I want you all to be blessed. I want you all to win. I want you all to have good things for your life. But you have to go out there and get them for yourself. And the way you do that is you put your faith and your trust in the Lord. And you say, God, I'm going to put my hands to the plow and I'm going to commit myself to, to uh, improving and, and doing the things you've called me to do. I'm going to commit myself to living my life in a way that's consistent with your word. I'm going to commit myself to being a good steward of my faith. I'm going to trust you even when thing, things seem bleak and I don't know where things are going to come from and resources. I'm going to put my faith in you and I'm going to believe that you have a better plan because I'm walking in proper alignment with your word. Now, if that's you, you're opening yourself up for the blessing. But a lot of times what happens is that people have a tendency to get used to being misaligned with God's word. And yet things still happen that are good for them. So they're lulled into the sense of, hey, it's okay to be misaligned and, and, and uh, still walk in the blessing of the Lord. But I'm here to tell you that God requires proper biblical alignment. Proper biblical alignment with his word and for his will for your life. So if you're walking in a situation where you're out of alignment, you're going to miss what it is that God has for you. And I feel like that's a word from the Lord today, and it's tied into the word today. And how many people notice I'm standing over here and not at the pulpit? You see, we do that because we want to help you guys to understand that we got to move to a place where God has called us to move, a new place, a place of advancement, a place of elevation, a place where we've not been before. And as we go to this new place, by faith, God's going to show us this new place. He's going to help us in our walk with the Lord. And as we achieve these new things, we are going to uh, advance and mature and grow. And that's the key in building people to build people, to advance, to mature, to grow. We don't want to be the same guy we were. We don't want to stay in the same place that we were. We want to move forward. We want to forcefully advance the kingdom of heaven. And the only way that will happen is if forceful men and women lay hold of it for themselves. Amen? So let's talk about it. Number one of five reasons why the New Testament sanctuary is superior to the Old Testament and why the New Testament plan is a better plan, and that is that the New Testament sanctuary is a heavenly sanctuary. Let's read it in verse 11 of chapter 9 of the book of Hebrews. If you have your Bibles or on your iPhones or iPads or iDevices, or you can just look at the screen. But Christ came as high priest for the good things to come. With the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. 
See, the Hebrew writer has already emphasized this before, wanting his readers to focus on the heavenly temple and not the earthly one. So the Old Testament temple, it was made by, by men, but the New Testament temple was made by God. And this phrase, not of this creation, infers that Moses' temple was constructed with materials that were made from this creation, wood, stone, mortar, uh, gold, fabric, and such. But the New Testament sanctuary in heaven is eternal and created from the resources of heaven. Now you tell me, would you rather have something that's made with the resources of men or the resources of God? If you say God and you want that, you know you're moving in the right direction because I don't care how rich you can be or all the stuff you can get. It's temporary, friend. You're going to punch out of this life one day and none of that stuff is going with you. So we've got to focus on that thing which is eternal. Did you know that when you tithe and give to missions, you are tapping into the resources of heaven? Your stewardship of your life is not just financial, but it's eternal. And when God blesses you, he does so from his rich, abundant supply, a heavenly supply. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of rich people who have an abundance of things, who have abundance of resources. But without Jesus, these things are only temporary. What we're looking for is eternal resources. It's eternal blessings that come from God who has the resources of heaven. And that's what I'm talking about here. The phrase, good things to come, speaks to that which has already arrived in Christ. The Old Testament gives us hundreds of verses that pertain to the coming Messiah. And they are manifested in the Old Testament tabernacle that foreshadow Christ's current priestly ministry in heaven. So we are encouraged to know that our Christ is working and moving and doing. The Old Testament tabernacle was patterned after the heavenly sanctuary. But today in the New Testament, we no longer need the pattern because we have the eternal one represented in Christ. Our bodies now are the temple of the Holy Spirit as Christians, and he dwells within us. Praise the Lord. Number two of the five reasons why the New Testament sanctuary is better than the Old Testament and why this New Testament plan is a better plan. And that is that the New Testament sanctuary represented in Christ deals with sin permanently. In verse 12, the Bible says, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all. Somebody say once for all. Having obtained eternal redemption. You see, the shed blood of clean animals in the Old Testament was inadequate to solve man's sin problem. The blood of animals was carried by the high priest into the Holy of Holies once per year. But Jesus presented himself to the Father on our behalf once for all and has become the final and complete sacrifice for sin. And while the animal sacrifices were repeated, Jesus offered himself one time for everybody. No animal sacrifice could ever purchase eternal redemption for man's sin. It could only cover it until the time when Christ's blood was offered to take away the sins of the world. John the Baptist says it this way in John chapter 1 and verse 29. He's out there baptizing people there in the river Jordan. And the Bible says there, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It was a prophetic announcement as John saw Jesus walking. He is the lamb. He is the sacrificial lamb that has atoned for our sin. Our eternal redemption is not conditioned on our merit or on our works, but it is secure in the finished work of Jesus if we receive it and we walk in his statutes. I want to remind people, it wasn't enough that Christ died for your sin. Please understand this. People say, I thought that was enough. It's not enough for the deal to go through. There's something required on our part. The Bible says there is no, therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And people often stop there. But Paul says this, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Because it's possible for a person to invite Christ into their life, but continue to walk according to the flesh. And one cancels out the other one. We've got to walk according to the spirit. Anybody can walk down to an altar and say a few words. But God is looking for the man that comes down and makes the good confession and then lives it every single day. And that's why we need the power of the Spirit of God working in us and moving in us and drawing us closer to Him in a greater committed relationship with the Father. We don't want to be misaligned. I hope you're hearing the heart of the Lord as I put that forth there. 
You see, the message from the Old Testament is clear. We must walk within God's statutes in order to receive his redemption. And a key part of that redemption is the shedding of blood. In your Bibles, verses 13 and 14, the writer goes on to say, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You see, the Old Testament ceremonial sacrifices were all about purifying the flesh but not the cleansing of the conscience. You see, if the worshiper obeyed the prescribed regulations of the law and followed the statutes that were given therein, they were declared clean. But it did nothing for the conscience. It'd be like, I'll use the young people as an example. Some of these young people that are here today, they may not want to be here today, but they're here because their parents said, you know, I need you to go to church. And if you want to live in our house, you're going to go to church because that's what we do. So you go to church, but you might have this tendency to feel like, wow, I kind of feel like I'm being forced. And in a way, you are. But it's good for you, just like broccoli is good for you, or working out on a regular basis, or drinking lots of water. It's good for you. The problem is there's going to come a day in your life, young person, where you've got to choose for yourself. And you're going to have to decide whether you want to continue walking with the Christ, or if you want to drift away like so many young people today do, because they think that their life belongs to themselves. The problem is that none of our lives belong to ourselves. The Bible says we have been bought with a price. And if you don't believe me, no problem. Just punch on through to the other side and trust God for your salvation. But you need to trust him before you do that because it'll be too late. Because you don't belong to yourself. You belong to the Lord. Most people, don't, they forget that. We belong to the Christ. The phrase, the ashes of a heifer, speak to this end. I'm going to read you an excerpt from Numbers 19 that provides a close-up on the need for these heifer ashes. In Numbers 19, verses 1 through 6, the Bible says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect, and on which a yoke has never come. And you shall give it to Eleazar the priest, that he may take it outside the camp, and it shall be slaughtered before him. And Eleazar the priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meaning. Well, then the heifer shall be burned in his sight. Its hide, its flesh, its blood, and its fall shall be burned. A fall is like guts. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast them in the midst of the fire, burning the heifer. Now, I want to remind everybody here, if you don't know this, that red heifers were common in the Old Testament. But lo and behold, if it were not true that after Christ came and gave his life on the cross, all of a sudden we didn't see the mass production of red heifers anymore. It's like they went away. Go figure. Just like the temple went away in A.D. 70. Go figure. You see, God didn't want the Jewish people distracted with the Old Testament. He removed that and said, look, folks, I'm the guy. Trust me. I'm the Messiah. Put your faith and trust in me. The Old Testament, old system, temporary, will no longer work. You have to trust me. I want you to consider the following. I'm reading an excerpt from Israel today. From, uh, this is from June of 2014. Finding a red heifer is like finding a needle in a haystack. But the early this week, some overly industrious Jew managed to do just that in the United States. The red heifer is an extremely rare creature. According to Jewish tradition, during the 2,000 years from its time uh, this commandment was given until the destruction of the second temple in the first century AD, only nine red cows that met the biblical criteria were ever found. For a cow to be a red heifer, it has to be without blemish, one that is never put to work and completely reddish. Jewish law requires keeping the young cow under strict care until it reaches three years old. During this time, leaning on the cow, riding it even once or ever, putting a piece of cloth on its back disqualifies it from becoming a red heifer. Strict rules also apply to its color. Two single hairs of a color other than red automatically disqualify it from being a red heifer. A red heifer candidate that, uh, that was discovered in 2000 was disqualified after two black hairs were found on it. Likewise, a cow that meets all other criteria, but this older than four is disqualified. The present calf has a, a long way until, if at all, it will become a real red heifer. That was in 2014. 
the reason why I'm saying this to you is if we believe that the new temple, the, 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 what we call the tribulation temple, or the third temple, will be built, they will need a red heifer to be able to follow this practice. So it's not uncommon that the Lord would now allow one to be born for such a time as this. I want you to know we're close to the master's return. Hopefully you can receive that. But I do share this article only to say that we're moving ever closer to the construction of this third temple in Jerusalem as spoken of in Bible prophecy. The arrival of this red cow was part of the fulfillment of end times, and we are close to the return of the Lord. Now, the cleansing of our conscience cannot be achieved by some Old Testament external ceremony. This demands the internal power that is manifest by the Holy Spirit of God in the New Testament. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 3. He says, You are epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, the heart. In other words, we are the temple. The phrase without spot speaks to the perfection of Jesus as he approached the cross. His life was sinless, and he was without blemish. And as a result, he was able and qualified to offer the perfect sacrifice himself. Verse 15 says this, And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant. By means of death, for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. You see, the blessing of God under the Old Testament was dependent upon the obedience of God's people. If they obeyed God, then he blessed them. If they disobeyed God, he would withhold his blessing upon them. How like today, God's blessing flows on those who are obedient to his word, but are restricted on those who are disobedient. We must bring ourselves into proper alignment. These blessings were temporary in nature. Rain, bumper crops, protection from enemies, healing of sicknesses. Israel's inheritance into the promised land involved these temporary material blessings. But the blessings of the New Testament covenant are spiritual in nature, and they are eternal. This eternal inheritance speaks to our redemption in Christ Jesus. So as New Testament believers... We have confidence that all we have in Christ is secure and eternal. If you're worried about your 4013B or 401K or whatever you got in your retirement plan, trust me, you have a retirement plan that is out of this world if you're a believer in Jesus. Be encouraged. Be encouraged and know it's not over just yet. You see, we see here in this passage that there's no final and complete redemption under the Old Covenant. You see, the sins of the Old Testament saints were covered by the blood of animals, but they were not totally cleansed until the perfect sacrifice was offered in Jesus. Paul says it this way in Romans 3. He says this, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is Jesus Christ, whom God sent forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Right there you know that if you invite Christ to be the Lord of your life, your sins are cleansed. You are justified in his sight. Justified means justified, never sin. Wiped clean away. That's the kind of power that Christ has for you for salvation. And since Jesus has accomplished an eternal redemption, we are able to share in this eternal inheritance. His eternal inheritance that he gives to us through this sacrifice. Praise the Lord. Number three. The New Testament sanctuary's ministry is based on a costly sacrifice. Verses 16 through 18 say this. For where there is a testament, there must also be the necessity, be the death of the testor. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testor lives. Testador lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. Now the word testament used twice in this passage, carries it with the idea of covenant or an agreement or a last will and testament. Some of you guys have wills. Some of you guys have rich uncles who have wills, and you're hoping that you're in their will. Amen? Come on now. If a man writes his will, that man is the testador. 
His death legally activates the conditions laid out in the will. The will's criteria won't take place until that man dies. And likewise, Jesus is the testador for our spiritual benefit. It was necessary for Christ to die so that the terms of the new covenant offered in his own blood might be activated. In other words, you don't have a rich uncle. You have a heavenly father who gave his life, and you're listed in the will. And what is, bent, what is coming to you is eternal in nature if you put your faith and your trust in Jesus. Now, we remember the sacrifice every time we celebrate Holy Communion. Luke 22:20, 20, the Bible says, Likewise, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. We do this every first Sunday of the month. You come back next Sunday, we'll be taking communion again. We do this to remember what Christ did for us on a cross 2,000 years ago. Now, one man said it this way. Christ dying on a cross is like having a rich uncle who died and left you with as many riches. Except Christ isn't our rich uncle. He is our heavenly father who desires to give you many good things if we place our faith and our trust in him. Let's read on, verses 19 through 21. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. You see, the Old Testament covenant was established on the basis of shed blood and death of clean animals, for that purpose, which is a holy sacrifice to the Lord. The passage here in verses 19 through 21 is taken from Exodus 24, verses 3 through 8, and it is an account of the ratifying of the Old Covenant by Moses and the children of Israel. For the sake of time, I will not read that to you, but tell you that it's in Exodus 24, verses 3 through 8. And here we see the book of the law being sprinkled with blood, as were the people and the tabernacle and its furnishings. The Israelites committed to the Lord that they would obey his statutes according to his covenant set in blood. History would record that they negated their word to the Lord and invoked the judgments also prescribed in this covenant. I want to remind people that blood was used at the beginning of the ministry of the Old Covenant, and it was used regularly to administrate the tabernacle services. And under the Old Covenant, people and objects were purified by blood, by water, and or fire. Think about that. All of this was ceremonial purification, making persons and objects acceptable to God. But this did not alter the nature of the person being purified. God's most basic and necessary principle is that blood must be shed for the sin to be forgiven. In Leviticus 17.11, the Bible says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So since blood was shed in the Old Testament, it's logical to understand that the shedding of blood be necessary to enact the New Testament covenant, which was given by Christ on a cross. The pattern of the Old Testament was purified by the sprinkling of blood. The blood of Jesus not only purifies the conscience of the believer, but the heavenly place. In the New Testament era, when we pray, we commune with the Father who is in heaven. In essence, we are communing with God who is in the heavenly place, the holy of holies in the kingdom of heaven. For God to receive our prayers into this holy place, blood must be applied. And in this case, it's the only by the shed blood of Jesus that we can gain entrance into God's presence. So when we commune with the Father, it's always through the Son, Jesus. Verse 22 says this, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there's no remission. See, the Old Testament covenant was established in the blood of clean animals. The New Testament covenant was established by the shed blood of Jesus. So if you're here today and you are still holding on to an Old Testament pattern, it doesn't work anymore. You need the New Testament to work. The New Testament is established on the basis of a better covenant, a better plan. God's plan for redemption for the sin of mankind. It was the only way to redeem humanity from the consequence of their sin. In verse 23, the Bible says, Therefore it was necessary 
that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So the Old Testament tabernacle is a temporary prototype of the New Testament permanent temple in heaven. We can now have access to this temple if and when we are purified by Christ's blood and made holy in him. Put it to you another way, Christ's sacrifice on the cross was both costly and necessary for our access to the Father through the Son. Jesus says it this way, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So Christ is the door that we must cross through. You do understand that for Jewish people, they have not made that connection. See, a Jewish person only worships God the Father. They don't worship the Son, and they certainly don't recognize the Holy Spirit, just God the Father. I don't know if you knew that or not. Because they're still in the Old Testament. But you and I as Christians, we recognize our Jewish roots, but we also recognize the Son, and we also recognize the Spirit whom the Son sent as our great comforter. So we need to understand that the concept of the New Testament covenant is based on a triune God. Muslims don't recognize uh, God as, as we recognize God. The God of the Muslims is Allah, and the Quran says that Allah had no son. So it's clear that the God of the Christians is not the same God as the God of the Muslims. I realize that's not politically correct, but it's true. So go with truth, amen? I think it's important that we understand that as we recognize these sacred truths, it helps us to align ourselves biblically with what God is saying. And if we can understand that, it's going to help us to grow. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. And while you're thinking about that, let's go to the fourth reason. The New Testament sanctuary represents the fulfillment of the new covenant. Verse 24 says this, For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. You see, the New Testament relationship with Jesus is our reality. We don't need a priest to intercede on our behalf for us to get to the Father. Jesus has become our mediator. We must not place our faith in God based on things, people, or places made with hands. Religious people tend to do this with their religious relics and props that they, de that they deem holy. But these will not last. You see, our faith must be in Christ and Christ alone. One man said it this way. I gave up on God because my preacher had a moral failure. So I gave up on God. Unfortunately, that will not help that man on judgment day. Every person must give an account of their own life to the Father and those things that they have done in this life. In other words, you can't blame another for your spiritual constipation. You must and you will give an account for your life in judgment. Does that work for everybody okay? Everybody understand that okay? You see, our, our Old Testament tabernacle, the Old Testament tabernacle, was replaced by Solomon's temple, which was restored, destroyed by the Babylonians. And when the Jews returned to Jerusalem after their captivity under Nehemiah, they rebuilt their temple, and a few hundred years later, Herod remodeled it. But in 70 AD, the Romans destroyed the temple, which has never been rebuilt to this day. The Jews are not sure who is even qualified to minister in the temple when it is rebuilt because the genealogical records have been lost. These are all things made with hands that perish, but things not made with hands are eternal, which brings us to the fifth reason. The New Testament sanctuary's ministry is final and complete. You see, the work of Jesus is a completed work. It's final and it's eternal. Even now, Jesus continues to minister in heaven on our behalf. In your Bibles, Hebrews 9, 25 through 28. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year without, with blood of another. He then would have um, had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Verse 27 says this, and folks, let me just tell you something. If you believe in reincarnation, I can throw it out in one verse, and this is the verse right here. And it is appointed a men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So you don't come back as a frog or a fish or a bird or a rhinoceros. You're done, baby, when it's over. You will stand before God in judgment and give an account for your life. 
So stand by one. It's going to happen. Verse 28 says this, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Thank God we're looking for Christ to appear. That word appear is used three times in verses 24 through 28. And it's used to summarize Christ's work in the past, in the present, and in the future. You see, he has appeared to put away, put away sin by a sacrifice on the cross. That's in the past. He is appearing now in heaven, interceding for us at God's right hand. That's in the present. And he will appear soon in the rapture to receive New Testament believers, living and dead. That's in the not-too-distant future. Amen? Praise the Lord. These three tenses of appear used here speak to the assurance of our salvation that is based on a finished work by Christ Jesus through his death and through his resurrection. There is no middle ground when it comes to serving Jesus. Think about it. You're either saved or you're not saved. We all have a choice between the earthly or the heavenly, the temporary or the eternal, the incomplete or the complete. And as we conclude our study in Hebrews 9, we recognize these five reasons why the heavenly sanctuary is superior to the, to the earthly one. Worship team, come on up. Number one. The New Testament sanctuary is a heavenly one. Number two, it's represented in the Christ and it deals with sin permanently. Number three, its ministry is based on a high cost, a costly sacrifice. Number four, it represents the fulfillment of the new covenant. And number five, its ministry is final and complete. So the New Testament believer's sanctuary is our sanctuary. It is in heaven, it's better, it's eternal. Our Father is in heaven. Our Savior is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our treasures are in heaven. Our hope is in heaven. While we walk by faith and not by sight, we are confident that one day we will receive those things God has for us that he has kept for us in heavenly places through Christ Jesus our Lord. So let me just remind you, with all the election hoopla that's going on and the uncertainty of economies and geopolitical systems, let me just say this. No matter what happens on earth, we can be confident that everything pertaining to our life and godliness in Christ Jesus is settled in heaven. Somebody give God the glory. Amen. Praise the Lord.